Hello, everyone. Welcome to the next episode of Insecurity, episode 15. On today's episode, we're talking about something people have been waiting for for at least 15 weeks, if not longer. They want to hear about Bitcoin. What is Bitcoin? How it works? Why should they invest or not invest in it? And is it really going to make them a million dollars or a billion dollars or whatever it is? Well, I'm Haim Cohen, and I know nothing about Bitcoin other than a lot of it, but I'm going to let Tom Webster talk about exactly what is Bitcoin and why should we care. Well, I, I would pull some Bitcoins out of my pocket to show you what they look like, but they're bits. It's like if you asked me to show you a torrent file yeah, by, by showing you it, by pulling it out of my pocket. Just like a really cookie. Do that. Yeah, Just exactly. like a cookie. Yeah, so, so Bitcoins have no physical form. Unless you uh, unless you buy the collector's ones, which are really expensive now, because they only made a few of them. I really did want one of those when I heard that they were actually a thing. I checked the price, and they are not cheap. Oh no, not at all. We may need to three D print some of these. Oh, I know, I know, they're so cool. So, bitcoins, and actually, thankfully, someone has come up with. Yeah, the, the one sentence thing that makes people get it. Um, Bitcoins are, and this was, this was published in an article, these are not my words, and I am stealing them because it's so perfect. Uh, Bitcoins are the Napster of banking. So I heard that the other day. I did hear that. I, don't, I didn't understand it, but I did hear it. The, the general idea behind it is that... Um, you know how Napster completely revolutionized downloadable music, peer-to-peer -peer file sharing? I mean, it, it kicked off the decentralization of the Internet. Like, it, it made people go, wait a minute, this decentralization thing is really cool. It means no one can stop me. If I wanted to give you a file, I could just give you a file. There's nothing that stops that. I don't have to go through anyone. And if you wanted to give me a file back and we just wanted to trade stuff, we could do that all day long. And then, of course... Napster gets sued, they get taken offline, their centralized servers get taken offline, people come up with better piracy uh, or, or better ways of file sharing, um, like BitTorrent. Um, so really the better, probably the better analogy is uh, Bitcoin is the BitTorrent of the banking industry. Um, there's no clearinghouse, there's no centralized anything, it's all people and people that make it happen. Well, let's start first. I mean, we talked about it is a virtual currency, but what do we do with it? How do we how do we start with it? So the how you start with it, um, there's a lot of different ways you can go. The first thing that I would suggest for everyone to look at first. So pause the episode um, or or watch it if you're watching live. Watch it right after us. Go to weusecoins.com. They've got a great like two-minute video that explains the general, you know, what's what of Bitcoin, what makes it cool, why is it unhackable or supposedly unhackable, uh, and what makes it different than something like PayPal. Um, the, the basic bottom line is Bitcoin um, solves the classic computer science problem of what we call double spending. So if I've got, if I've got an MP3, so here's my MP3. How do I send this to you on my computer and I make sure that you have it, but I don't have a copy? How do I make sure that I've given this to you and I no longer have access to it? And usually the way you do that is through a clearinghouse or through a third party or, you know, I'm going to gift you something and I don't have access to it anymore. But how do you do that independently? How do you do that, you know, across the Internet or through email? Or, you know, it's, it's a big problem. How do we solve that? Um, and the way Bitcoin has chosen to solve this classic problem is with a public ledger. So all transactions in the Bitcoin network are public, absolutely public. Now, the thing about that is it's not going to say, you know, Tom Webster sent this amount of money to Bob Smith. Um, instead... Bitcoin addresses are just these random long strings of text. And every time you make a transaction, if you're using the correct client, each time you make a transaction, that address will change. Meaning it's a semi-anonymous currency 
that you can send bitcoins to everyone else. And because the transactions are public, when you open up your program, it looks at the big transaction ledger, runs through every transaction and says, okay, at the end of the day, the bottom line says you have this many coins available in your account right now, available to this wallet. And when you send them, it cuts a transaction. It says, okay, you just sent those to this guy. And then when that guy loads up his client, it runs through and says, hey, look, you got coins. Cool. And uh, you no longer have them. So it doesn't go ba based on, let's say, a check register where it trusts you to do it or we trust the program. The program goes to the ledger and pulls everything? Right. But it's not like a centralized ledger. It's not like they go to PayPal or Jawala or Google Wallet and says, hey, how much money does this guy have? Because that would break the general idea of you know, decentralizing finance. Instead, Bitcoin, just like BitTorrent, is powered by the network. You get BitTorrent clients come onto the network, and they are the checkers of this public ledger. They hold the public ledger, and you need to convince, when you make a transaction, you need to convince 51% of the network that this is the transaction that you're making, and then they stamp it down. They say, yes, this is a transaction. And unless you compromise over half the Bitcoin network, you cannot trick it. You cannot double spend. Well, that's good to know. I mean, you're not trusting one individual source, and that was good. My, my question with that is, if you make lots of microtransactions, let's say you're making thousands in a day, can somebody looking at this ledger figure out who you are based on, I don't know, uh, reverse or socially engineering the ledger? Like, I'm assuming that I'm some 256-bit hash, and if they see a lot of them and they can see kind of where it's going, can they, can they try and figure out using the powers that be to who you are? Um, yeah, they could. Um, just like any public ledger or even, you know, if you're watching, I mean, email is a bad example, but if you're watching a lot of traffic go by, you can do traffic analysis to try to figure out who someone is. Um, in that case, that's why I don't want to say Bitcoin is totally anonymous, because it's not. It's a public ledger. They've got, you know, IP addresses stamped down for the main, you know, the main um, client that stamped down your transaction first, the people who have confirmed it. Um, they know which address it came from, which address it went to, and the amount. So it's not entirely anonymous. It's what I like to call pseudo-anonymous or semi-anonymous is generally how it's referred to. You're not called out by name, but if somebody really wanted to, you know, go back through time and match all the points, yeah, they could figure out that, you know, the, these transactions here have to be by a singular person. That's what we're going to guess. I mean, not... It, the well, what I'm saying is, and I guess you're saying the same thing, this is not an easy thing to figure out. It, it's no. not, no. It's no. like, if, could the NSA, knowing what we know, I bet you they could do it, but that's still not going to be easy for them. Right. It does take a whole lot of work, and there is a whole lot of traffic going across the Bitcoin network. Um, and one and thing it's only going to get worse, right? It's only going to oh, get, yeah. as it gets more popular, this yes. is going to be way harder to figure out. Yeah. Um, one of the things that uh, people have come up with, they said, well, this isn't really super anonymous. And because Bitcoin, I mean, it's a public protocol. It is public. It is open source. Anyone can take it, you know, copy it. They can hack on the code. They can make changes to it. The great thing about it being open source is there are people today, right now, saying, you know, Bitcoin isn't really private enough. We, I mean, it's good. It's better than PayPal, but... You know, that's not really that good. We can make this better. So there are very smart people hacking on the protocol and saying, well, how can we make this truly anonymous? And they've come up with some really great ideas that they can later patch into the protocol to solve that problem or, you know, at the very least make it better. Um, in the meantime, what people have come up with are either they write a script or they can pay a, a small fee to use what's called a Bitcoin mixing service. So if I wanted to send you coins but I didn't want that paper trail coming back to something that could possibly be traced to me, I would send my coins to an address or run a script that would disperse my coins across a whole lot of addresses that would filter through the Bitcoin network, eventually coming to a point and sending to you. Like a Tor network for Bitcoins. Exactly. It's, it's quite literally, it's money laundering, it's Bitcoin laundering. 
Which, which again, it's since it's a decentralized currency, there's no laws against it. Right. There, and re- realistically, there can't be laws, right? I mean, how do you regulate this? It's like, it's like if you tried to regulate email, or if you tried to regulate BitTorrent, or if you tried to regulate just about anything on the internet. There are very few things on the internet that are, you know, regulated and well regulated. I mean, there are dark net sites everywhere. The Tor network has an entire undernet to it where people. You know, post everything from forums to blogs to, you know, terrorist funding sites. Um, it, it's it's uncontrolled. It's it's the internet. It's the wild west, and this is what the internet has created. Uh, you're not going to stop it, Glenn. Well, the I mean, so far we've said some positives, some negatives. Why should I guess we want? To, why should we use this? Why should we send money? Why can't we just send dollar bills or checks or use PayPal? And, and you can, and you know, for the vast majority of people, that's really the easiest option. Um, I've, I've worked with uh, a couple, uh, probably three or four people this week that said, hey, I need to get a lot of money to this person that's not really computer savvy, how do I do that? And most of the time, the, the thing we talked about, I suggest Square Cash. It's easy, it's simple on both sides, it's relatively secure, why not? And, you know, there are people who use PayPal, people who send money through Gmail, which you can do now. Um, Bitcoin, the reason why you would use that is you don't have to rely on anyone else. Yeah, there are online wallets you can use. And if you're looking to get started with with Bitcoin, I highly suggest Coinbase. It's easy to get started. You can buy and sell Bitcoin right there. It's It just makes everything really safe and easy to use. Um, but if you're using the official Bitcoin, what they call Bitcoin QT client, it's all on you. You are the bank. Um, You don't have to worry about PayPal freezing your account. You don't have to worry about chargebacks. There's no such thing as a chargeback. You don't have to worry about paying all these fees to, you know, Western Union or Google or or anyone. It's, you are transmitting bits and that's it. It's all on you. There's no middleman. Which gets us into the next point of why we're talking about it is the security aspect of it, which, right. which is because it's all on you. It's literally all on you. There's no police that you can call and and everything else. It's right. you are the end all be all, and if you don't keep it secure, you are in trouble. Yeah, the the way Bitcoin works is uh, it's very similar to cash. If you have ten thousand dollars sitting in your wallet and somebody mugs you, guess what? It's gone. Same thing with Bitcoin. If you don't you know, encrypt your wallet, which is a part of the program, if you don't encrypt your wallet, if you're using a malware-infected computer and you're typing in you know, your Bitcoin encryption passphrase, they can be stolen. And it's not just can, they have been stolen before. And there's lots of Bitcoin malware out there looking to steal your coin. So if you're going to use Bitcoin, be safe about it, encrypt your wallet, don't there was a, a scam going around. Um, an email came by. It said it was from Google. It looked really legitimate. It said, your Bitcoin wallet might be compromised. You should upload your wallet.dat file to this website. We'll check and make sure it's okay for you. And your wallet file is quite literally like handing your wallet to someone. You say, hey, look, here, here's my wallet, okay? Don't take anything. Just check to make sure it's safe. Yeah, no, those coins are gone. Absolutely gone. Uh, so the, one of the safer options is you can do Bitcoin cold storage, which is what I do for the majority of my Bitcoins. Um, it, you print out a paper wallet, and you've got a QR code, and you can send Bitcoins, because all it is, it's a, a piece of text. It's an address. It's like an email address. You just send to it, but it's never connected to the Internet. You can't, As far as I know, there is no paper malware. Um, you know, throw it in a safe, safety deposit box, yeah, keep it in your wallet if you really want to, hide it somewhere, eat it, whatever. Um, and then on the other side of this paper, they've got the private key, which you can scan and redeem. You can actually pull your coins out of that paper. So what people do is they take the majority of their coins, put it in these paper wallets, and then lock them in a safe. And, you know, that that's your bank, essentially. That's your bank account. And, you know, you keep a small amount. You keep a couple hundred bucks in your, your what they call the hot wallet or your online wallet. And that way you can do transactions. You can buy and sell stuff, anything from alpaca socks to video games. Well, 
that that's the main that's a good explanation of it and exactly the right security keep a little bit there and a little bit outside in these papers but one of the biggest misconceptions I've heard to date is the only way to get bitcoins is to mine bitcoins and I know that is completely false mining is another cool aspect of bitcoins and it solves the printing money problem that how do you print money for a digital currency you want to take right. us through how do you what mining bitcoins really means? Sure. So let's go through the easy high level, and then I'll take you into some of the tech behind it. Uh, and we're not going to go too deep into it and exactly what protocols are used, but basically, because the Bitcoin network, it's all you know, it's made by people. Um, we need some way to create this currency out of thin air. And we can't just say, hey, there's a million Bitcoins, because, you know, who who gets those? Who's the, the holding place? Where's the Bitcoin central bank? Where's the federal Bitcoin reserve? There isn't one. This is a distributed, decentralized system. There are no bosses. There are no, you know, big banks on Wall Street that are too big to fail. How, how do we make this money? And the answer is when you send a transaction, you need to convince someone that tra transaction is legitimate. And how that happens is there are computers in the Bitcoin network, and they are solving, uh, they're, they're called miners. They are solving cryptographic problems that are very hard for a computer to do. They're solving these cryptographic problems, and they're saying, okay, well, to fit this transaction into the public ledger, we need to solve this problem that's connected to it. And, you know, they, they hammer away at it, and they do a bunch of math, and there's a bunch of mathematical, cryptological magic that happens behind the scenes. But when they solve it, they say, this looks like an answer. And they present that answer, the, the miner presents that answer to the Bitcoin network. They say, hey, I, I think I found the answer. Is this right? And they hold up the answer for the entire Bitcoin network, and the Bitcoin network looks at it, and they go, hmm, okay. I'll verify that, and congratulations, you've got one verification on your transaction. You need six to actually get it stamped down in the public ledger, so you convince six miners that that is indeed the answer to the cryptographic problem, and you don't have to do this manually. This is all automatic, auto-magical stuff that happens in the background when you send money to someone, um, and they mine it, it gets put into the public ledger, and as a bonus, as a you know, a thank you present of the Bitcoin network to the miner that solves the problem, they say, here are 25 Bitcoins, or here are 50 Bitcoins. And the number was high, and it keep, it'll keep getting lower, and there are going to be a finite number of Bitcoins in the world. And the current estimate is around 2035, 2038, when the number will finally, you know, they'll stop giving out prizes. Instead, you'll just get transaction fees. And one way you can sort of make the transactions faster, because if you don't pay any transaction fees, they are kind of slow. Um, you know, you might wait 30 minutes to an hour for something to be fully confirmed. But you can say, hey, look, if uh, you solve this problem quickly, Mr. Miner, i got some money for you. And you attach a transaction fee. And the miner goes, oh, wait, wait, I want to solve the expensive one first because I want that money. And the Bitcoin miners will churn on that, and you know what? They get the bonus and the transaction fees that are included in that block, in, in the list of transactions they're adding to the ledger. Um, so that's how mining works. And they're solving, what they're doing is they're solving hash problems. They're, they're solving SHA, they're basically cracking SHA hashes to make this thing work. So it takes a whole lot of effort, and the difficulty isn't static. So, you know, back when Bitcoins first came out, people were just like, oh, yeah, no, I'll just throw my, you know, Pentium 3 or my i3 on it. And, uh, yeah, I'm going to get I'm looking for Bitcoins. I'm looking for what you said, the, the, the rate of which you can mine, mine these coins. So, like you said, or you're about to say, is that, yeah, it was really easy at first, and it's getting harder. It's based on some half-life, and I'm looking for it. We'll put it in the show notes. But, like you said, 2038 is going to be, the, the total number of Bitcoins is going to be there, and that's it. No more Bitcoins after that. Right. So which, you want to, yeah, which, so what you want to do is, if you got it on the ground level, it was easier. As it gets harder, every whatever, that it's it's going down and down and down, and it's going to oh, be yeah. almost impossible by 2038. 
way way back in the day, and I've since sold these coins, and I'm kicking myself for it today. But back when coins were worth, you know, a buck a piece, I mined. I was using my graphics card, and I had mined ten coins, and they hit ten bucks a piece, and I sold them, and I was so excited. Look at that! I just turned my power because my computer was already on and running into a hundred dollars. That was ecstatic. Um, but if I set my graphics card to start mining today, I'd make pennies. So the Bitcoin network looks at the miners. They look at the total power they're throwing at these hashes. And they say, okay, okay, how many people do we have mining? How much power is in the network? Okay, we need to ramp up this difficulty. So the coins are being mined at pretty much a consistent level. And the, the difficulty changes every so often. And it's, it's been getting harder because now we have specialized chipsets that will mine bitcoins at an alarming rate. I've got a bitcoin miner sitting here doing its thing and the difficulty has raised so much that you know before when I was you know making the bitcoins at a pretty decent clip now they're trickling in and this thing is only going to get more useless as time progresses and that's I mean mining should be done as it gets more popular it'll even out because not one person with a supercomputer can just sit there and mine all the bitcoins forever. The network will take over and they'll say, look, no, the difficulty is getting raised. I'm looking now for this. I saw it today. I'm trying to get it back. Newegg is selling a mining machine almost. And they're, and they're deeming it and they're calling it the mining machine. It's $2,800 oh. and it's six video cards. Yeah, unfortunately... Two of my little $300 miners probably puts out uh, more hashes, what we call more giga hashes, than that rig would. Um, you see, graphics cards were kind of the original way to mine coins really quickly. Somebody said, wait a minute, CPUs are good, graphics cards are way better for this type of math. So they created these programs around graphics cards, and they said, okay, all right, let's mine this, let's go crazy. And people were building these giant rigs of all these video cards hooked together. They were spending thousands upon thousands of dollars and making it back in a couple weeks. It was nuts, it was crazy. And now, you buy two or three of these ASIC chipsets, and you've already doubled that power. And now, graphics cards can't really compete in the mining space. Yeah, they help. Yeah, you're going to make some money, but the general consensus is you're going to spend way more in power keeping those graphics cards cooled than you would make. So it's not really worth it, unless you're just doing it to do it. In which case, go for it, because it helps uh, the mining community. It helps out Bitcoin as a whole. Well, I, lo I always looked at it from the beginning the power consumption, the cost to build the computer, all this other stuff just didn't make sense for me. I don't want to leave. Remember, you're probably running, each graphics card is probably five, 600 watts times four, times five, times six, running 24 hours a day. That's a lot of power. And you say, oh, but I keep my computer on. Yeah, well, if you're keeping your computer on to run a browser, it's not you're not using that much power. If you're running these dedicated rigs, you're using a lot of power, oh, and yes. you may not get anything. You may not get anywhere. You may, I mean, if you were doing it as a lone wolf, you may not hit the 50 bitcoins. So what people yeah. ended up doing was uh, distributing this over a whole bunch and making pairing agreements. Well, if one of us hits it, we're going to share it. And that's how I guess everyone's now making money. They're sharing yep. on their network, so they're getting point oh 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 one bitcoins every couple of days. But it's still it's still tough. And before you start getting into this, don't just listen to us. Really read into what you're doing. Like I said, yeah. this rig that I'm looking at is uh, six video cards, twenty six hundred dollars. Think about um, what what twenty six hundred dollars can buy you. Yeah, and so so we, we worked out the math. Me and a co-worker, because he was really, really close into mining, and I bought my mining chipset nine months ago. I received it two months ago because I was you know, way back in the list, um, and they had to get through all the other orders before they got to me. So I really wasn't happy, because when I bought it, I was like, oh, this is great. I'll get it in a month. It'll print money, pay itself off in a couple days, and then I'll just have a second income. That's not really the way it works. Um, 
because you'll get these, it'll come late. I mean, you will hit every branch of the Murphy's Law tree, and you know anything that can go wrong will go wrong. You will hit every single thing that will go wrong in that tr in that chain. Um, but you know, just like you're saying, I'm I'm not earning a whole bunch of bitcoins right now. I think every day I probably earn, you know, a, a buck maybe. It, it sits here. It's it's a low power model, so I'm not really concerned. It it makes more money than it takes up in power. Um, but as as someone who, if if you're looking at mining, look at it not as a get rich quick scheme because it certainly isn't. Uh, unless you're spending a hundred thousand dollars and you are creating your own ASIC chipsets, there's no real money to be made in mining. If you're saying, well, hey, I could mine Bitcoin today and it might be worth a billion dollars someday, okay, but wouldn't you be better in taking your twenty-eight hundred dollars and buying twenty-eight hundred dollars worth of Bitcoin? We worked out the math. If I would have spent when I bought this thing. If I would have spent, you know, the couple hundred bucks on Bitcoin instead of on the rig, uh, I would I would have made out a whole lot better than this thing's gonna gonna do for me. So if if you believe in the Bitcoin network, go ahead and mine. If you want to do something altruistic while making money, um, go ahead and start mining. Otherwise, if you're looking at just spending money and getting in on the ground floor, go to Coinbase, Coinbase.com. Go buy yourself some Bitcoin. Uh, it's easy to set up. It's secure. Um, it's it's honestly it's the most secure online wallet I've seen, and have fun with it. I mean, you buy. I don't. You can't at this point a thousand dollars or whatever it is. It's over nine hundred. Buying mm -hmm. one bitcoin is a lot, but maybe buy a quarter of a bitcoin and see how far that takes you and play around with it. The, what at that small value, you're not going to lose that much. Yeah, and it's so if you're doing this for an investment, if you're looking to sort of play the market, get into it, please remember above all else, do not invest more than you can lose because everyone freaked out. So Bitcoin crashes every three weeks, it seems like. So, you know, it hit fifteen hundred dollars and people are going nuts. Ah, you know what? I'm just gonna take my entire life savings and put it into Bitcoin. And then a week later it hits four hundred. And it crashes, and everyone's like, "Oh no!" And now it's up again to you know 950 or something, and it'll it'll keep doing this thing, and people are gonna still freak out. Please, do not put in any more money than you can reasonably afford to just play with and throw it to the wind. Treat it like a stock account. Just say, you know, this isn't. Or treat it like a very volatile stock account. This isn't for my retirement. This isn't for my kid's college fund. This is something I would go buy a couple scratch-off tickets with or I would take to the blackjack table. Treat it as something you're just going to toss away and see what happens. Yeah, you know, it's fun. Treat it like fun. It's the riskiest thing you can do at this moment. Yes. Other than going to, down to the ponies and betting on horses. I mean... Realistically, go, horses may be a more safe investment oh, than Bitcoin at this point. That could be true. Anyway, any last things? I'm sure there's going to be more on this, another episode, where we're going to dig deeper. But for right now, I think we hit all the major points. I think we did. This was a good high-level overview. There's a whole lot more tech about it. Uh, honestly, the person who's done the best deep dive into Bitcoin, other than you going and reading Wikipedia straight up, Go check out Security Now. Just throw it to Google. I'm going to make sure it works right now. Security Now Bitcoin. It's going to be in the show notes anyway. We'll find it. I think yeah. it's 126, but I could be wrong. Uh, or 226. 287? 287. 287. Bitcoin oh, cool. currency. Okay. So go check that out if you want You know the general for real people that you can show people that you can watch yourself to get interested, get a little bit more information WeUseCoins.com. It's got great information. It's got great links. It's got a mining guide right there. You can take all of our information and augment it by checking out these two things. Really, Steve Gibson does a great deep dive into the big crypto behind it, and it's a secure system. It is really, really secure. It's very hard to listen to. You really have to listen to it a couple times, but if you yes. want to learn, that's where you go. So, anything else? I think that's it. Okay, then, everybody, let's have a good night, and we'll see you next week. See you, guys. Bye.